Hello, class, and welcome back to the second half of the lecture on disturbances. As I mentioned already, this topic is very near and dear to my part um, because I researched this for my master's research. So still we're talking about restoration in this instance. The desire here was to restore a bottomland hardwood forest that was invaded by the shrub Chinese privet I'll tell you more about. There are many possibilities when it comes to invasive species mitigation. Therefore, it's important to strategically choose the right one so that it doesn't result in failure or wasted efforts, time, and money. So here's some background information. In an invaded forest in Memphis, Tennessee, in the year 2000, we removed Chinese privet from this site and we planted overcup oak and persimmon trees in place. These are bottom land species that were there before Chinese privet, the invasive shrub came in. So the folks in charge of the restoration assumed that those species would still be able to grow in this location because they were there first. Unfortunately, however, the trees that were planted were unable to survive and thrive because the disturbance regime to which they were adapted no longer occurred in this area. Plus Chinese privet was able to move back in and thrive in the absence of the disturbance. So this following example is intended to help you understand why disturbances can be so important in terms of restoration and land management. So some background about Chinese privet, the invasive shrub. The shrub is a very indescript shrub and it has a tendency to blend into the background. It is known as the silent invader, as was my Halloween costume there in the year 2012, a couple of years back. <laughs> so the shrub... Um, was brought in the 1850s as an ornamental hedgerow and because of its evergreen characteristics, broad environmental tolerance, rapid growth, and superior competitive ability, it made for a really great hedgerow and made for a great candidate for becoming an invasive species. Ba -ba -ba -bum. It reproduces vegetatively through runners or root induction on broken limbs. It also reproduces sexually via fruit. The single seeded droops are highly viable and a single privet plant can produce thousands of germinating offspring per year. These fruits then get dispersed into forests where they occupy the understory. And ultimately, the understory results in a shrub layer that is so dense that it prevents any sort of native regeneration. The invaded range of Chinese privet is pretty much everywhere in the Southeast. The study that we're talking about now was here in Southwest Tennessee on the Wolf River, which is a tributary to the Mississippi. The confluence of the Wolf River and the Mississippi River is in Memphis, Tennessee. And the location of the attempted restoration is an urban park called Shelby Farms Park. It is the, I believe the sixth largest urban park in the US or third in the US or something like that. It's big. Um, the main habitat surrounding the river is bottomland hardwood forests. So when we're talking about restoration, we want to talk about what are the ecosystem functions and services that we want to restore. So here are the ecosystem functions and services of bottomland hardwood forests. Bottomland hardwood forests are also known as forested wetlands because they experience frequent flooding and most of the trees are hardwoods. Uh, for example, like oaks and hickories and, and tupelos we see in this photo. So these forests have many ecosystem services and functions that make them unique. They sequester nutrients. They sequester sediments. They filter groundwater. And they create habitats for a wide diversity of endemic plant and animal species. So here we're gonna get a good example of a species assemblage. This would be the species that you'd wanna measure at the end to make sure that it matches you know, um, your reference. So this would be like your reference species assemblage. Oftentimes this is measured by just measuring the plants and the primary productivity, but a full inventory of taxa from all the kingdoms is always the best way. It's supported biodiversity such as the Indian pink flower, orange mycena, stag beetle. And this is really just me showing off the beautiful pictures. Bursting heart, not the best one there. This is my favorite grass, river oats, casmanthium latifolium. We've got a nice three-toed box turtle here, some blue vein and a sulfur butterfly. 
the downy woodpecker. And these are all native to these bottomland hardwood forests. Oh, and then there's my dog who is here to demonstrate that recreation is another service provided by these unique riparian ecosystems. So in addition to the many functions, the bottomland hardwood forest species are also uniquely adapted to these conditions. The bottomland trees are considered to be specialists as opposed to generalists because the specialists require flood pulsing to remain and persist. They're actually considered to be non-competitive. Not all specialists are non-competitive. These ones in particular are. Flood pulsing is a disturbance that has occurred in these forests for thousands of years. It has its own unique attributes as well, including seasonality, frequency, size, and severity. So in the winters, the rivers stretch out into the surrounding deltas. And at times, the Mississippi River could be up to over 100 miles wide during these winter pulses. But in the summer, the waters would retreat, leaving only the species that were adapted to this flooding. Many months where no oxygen could get to the roots would happen throughout the winter, and then in the summer, there would be plenty of oxygen. So these adaptations for these species are for typically anaerobic or low oxygen conditions. So some anaerobic adaptations include shallow roots, buttresses, lenticels, pneumatophores, which anchor the plant into the ground, as well as help with aeration. And then there are fluvial adaptations or adaptations that allow species to survive and thrive in strong currents, as demonstrated here. And that's the Wolf River. It's a very small river, typically. So fluvial adaptations include sprouting from broken limbs, as you can see here vegetative reproduction, water dispersal. That's how they get around and find new places to live. And that's also called hydrocory. So more information about the flood pulsing in these bottomland hardwood forests. The black line here represents the elevation of the floodplain. The green line is the monthly averages of stream height. Each year, the river was in a natural or a pulsing state. As you can see, for about three to five months out of the year, in the winter months, the water was above ground level, which creates a dynamically stable channel where the stream is connected to its adjacent riparian area. Unfortunately, this natural flood pulse was taking place in an area where urban settlement became a priority, Memphis, Tennessee. And one can't build anything in a place that is flooded for three or four months out of the year. Well, I mean, I guess they could build a houseboat, but the Army Corps of Engineers decided to channelize the lower 30 miles of the river as a method to control flooding in the town of Memphis, Tennessee. Though channelization had ceased by 1963, the forested ecosystem was altered dramatically and became incised, aka no longer connected to its floodplain. So I'm going to walk you through the history here of the channelization of the Wolf River. In the year 1940, the river still pulsed and the adjacent bottomland hardwood forest remained inundated throughout the winter. Pay close attention to the meanders in this river. By 1971, the channelization of the lower 30 miles of the Wolf River had been complete for eight years. Barely visible now are the meander scars. And by 2011, when that picture of the fully invaded forest was taken, one meander scar had disappeared into the eroding channel of the Wolf River, and the other is barely visible to the right. Chinese privet now occupies the region immediately adjacent to the Wolf River. The channelization resulted in the river lowering the water table, so the actual water surrounding the river, the table of water, lowered seven feet, which ultimately resulted in a discontinuation of the flood pulsing. But not only did the extent and severity of the disturbance change, but so did the seasonality and intensity. The peak river was back in February and is now peak flow is in May when trees are actually um, starting to leave rather than in February when trees are dormant. 
Moreover, the Wolf River became incised. And in another bit of irony here, the channelization of the river itself is an anthropogenic disturbance, one that prevented a natural disturbance regime, which opened the way for the invasion of Chinese privet, which is a biological disturbance made possible by the anthropogenic disturbance of river channelization. So just to get you thinking about how diverse these disturbances can be and how impactful they can be on ecosystems. So Chinese privet does not invade habitats that have natural flood pulses with long-term winter inundation. So now I'll explain how the prevention of natural disturbances of flood pulsing has assimilated the invasion of Chinese privet in hydrologically altered bottomland hardwood forests. So seasonal inundation is a disturbance. This natural flood pulsing resulting in long-term winter inundation reduces the ability for Chinese privet to establish. I wanted to test this experimentally and I did. I couldn't just rely on the observations that I made in nature. So the following two experiments were how I was able to conclude that seasonal inundation is a natural and necessary disturbance to maintain the health of the bottomland hardwood forests. I did a preliminary inundation study where I tested the hypothesis that Chinese privet cannot thrive in natural flood pulses. I collected seeds from Chinese privet and divided them into two treatments, a wet and a dry, to represent the natural systems and the altered system. Then I tested the viability of the seeds after either soaking them or giving them the dry treatment after 11 weeks using a tetrazoleum stain. Tetrazoleum reacts with digestive enzymes produced by the embryo of the plant. And if those enzymes are present, then the seed is alive and will stain red. If they are not present, then the seed is dead and non-viable and will not stain. The dry privet fruits germinated at a significantly higher rate than the wet treated privet fruits by between 29 and 44% on average. Then I did a field inundation study. I sowed 60 bags with 100 Chinese privet fruits per bag. I placed the bags in field locations that represented the three treatments. Wet, again, to represent the natural flood pulsing. Dry as a control and an additional treatment, the mid, which represented the riverine conditions after channelization, where some mild flooding occurred, but it was not long-term pulsing. So I tied the seed bags to the trees and I left them there for the amount of time that the rivers stayed pulsing throughout the winter season. And then once the natural water level subsided, I germinated the seeds in the greenhouse. All three treatments were statistically significantly different from one another. The greatest seed survival was in the mid-treatment. Next was dry. And the fewest surviving seeds were wet, supporting that long-term inundation makes the seeds non-viable. Something really interesting to note here is that the mid-treatment was so suitable for privet germination that many of the seeds actually germinated in the field. So inundation resulting from natural disturbance of flood pulsing reduced the germination of this invasive Chinese privet. So without getting into too much invasion theory, which is really cool, and I could do a whole class on it, um, these invasive plants don't really establish and create propagule pressure in the places that experience long-term seasonal inundation. Instead, they take advantage of novel niches created by altered disturbance regimes, and they utilize the water as a dispersal mechanism, which is another side note. Therefore, if one wanted to restore these bottomland hardwood forests, they might want to remove the privet and then plant something that can survive and compete in the new slash novel ecosystem that resulted from the channelization of the river. Or better yet, but less probable, considering that human dwellings are all along the Wolf River, but restoration ecologists could actually reintroduce the natural flooding disturbance to the land. Um, that's a term called emulating natural disturbance regimes. And this would be done here through re-meandering techniques, which would ultimately cause the rivers to rise and be reconnected with the floodplain. So let's talk about emulating natural disturbance regimes here in the Northwest or in any place where fires occur naturally. 
So right now there are researchers looking at how to emulate natural disturbance regimes, ENDR, to improve and restore ecosystems. We just learned that flooding can be an important disturbance for bottomland hardwood forests, which is true in all types of wetlands across the earth. Here in Idaho, the most common and instrumental natural disturbance is wildfire, which shapes ecosystem structure and function. Approximately 80% of forests in the West are considered to be vulnerable to hazardous wildfire, and wildfires are known to historically shape natural ecosystems. Historically, wildfires occurred frequently and at multiple different levels of severity, but many were non-lethal lethal, and were at low severity. However, with Western colonization came strenuous efforts to suppress and prevent fire. Despite that forest managers were able to reduce the, reduce the frequency of wildfires, the attempt to control this natural process backfired and resulted in excessive fuel buildup on the forest floors. Thus, when fires move into the region now, mass mortality is almost inevitable. Land that would have burned as a patchwork, a mosaic of varying burn severities and different levels of succession and levels of mortality now all have the same. Plus, changing climate has exacerbated and increased fire severity and extent in this region. Emulating natural disturbance regimes, ENDR, is a relatively new method for forest management and habitat restoration. Implementing prescribed fire to emulate natural disturbance regimes will allow ecosystems to recover quickly post-fire and enhance ecosystem processes. Natural, frequent, low-severity fires promote multi-successional forests and communities which proliferate biodiversity at different levels of succession. So if you want to know more about this, go ahead and watch the video that discusses fire regimes in the Northwest, in particular Yellowstone, and their importance. So more examples of emulating natural disturbance regimes. Many species of bird depend on late successional coniferous forests for habitat, which provides cavities and food providing seed, nuts, and berries. And birds also service the watershed by dispersing vegetation, um, seeds, and ridding trees of grubs and other pests. Contrary to birds, beavers need early successional trees such as alders and aspens to create dams. Through the process of dam building, beavers assert their roles as keystone species. They slow stream velocity, increase water storage capacity in the adjacent stream banks. They establish woody habitats for aquatic biota. Furthermore, beavers and birds create a positive feedback within their communities to help sustain resilient ecosystems. So here's a nice little depiction of how multiple levels of succession and landscape result in really great diversity. We've got here on the lower end, um, only a few species, uh, here completely different species in these more older growth forests and all of the different ones in the middle. So again, this is reiterating that the fires which create multiple habitat mosaics are actually very good for the Western landscape at historical levels of variability. So ecological memory is how emulating natural disturbance regimes work. So this is another, this is a theory in the ecological sciences. Disturbance history influences an ecosystem's response to novel disturbances, such that communities that have previously been exposed to disturbances should be more resilient to new disturbances compared to those sheltered communities. And this is principle again defined as ecological memory. Okay, so I would like you to define these following terms from the assigned reading, Miller et al., 2021. How disturbance history alters invasion success, biotic legacies, and regime change. So I will expect you to know the definitions of disturbance refugia, biotic legacy, abiotic legacy, disturbance history, press and pulse disturbances. And all of those are clearly defined in your reading.
And then, like I said, um, the next module, there is a video that talks about the history of fire in the Pacific Northwest is really, really entertaining. Um, so you can just click on that link on the next module. Okay, so that's our lesson on disturbances. Um, don't forget to take the quiz. All right, y'all have a great rest of your day or evening or whenever you are watching this.